Let's the fun begins a long time ago in a galaxy far far away this is rebel force radio your source for the force star wars news and commentary with jason swank and jimmy mack i've seen star wars 500 times so was the one this station is now the ultimate power in the universe i suggest we use it now it's time for rebel force radio we would be honored if you would join us All right, here we are once more, gathered together here in the afterglow of the big season finale of season one of Ahsoka. Of course, that's on the top of all of our minds as Star Wars fans. We got a great show for you this week if you've been thinking a lot about Ahsoka, like we have. By the way, if you haven't been uh, watching or listening to the uh, Ahsoka after shows, and we always find that there are these folks. I know that there are people out there that like to see these shows wrap up, especially when they're being dropped weekly. They want to go and they want to do the binge experience. Okay, go do the binge experience, but make sure that you add Rebel Force Radio Ahsoka after shows to that experience. They are available via audio podcasts and on our YouTube channel at uh, youtube.com slash Rebel Force Radio because I think they really do go a long way in uh, enhancing that experience. It certainly was the case for us. Speaking of, of enhancing that experience, we've got Kyle Newman coming up in the cantina this week, breaking down Ahsoka along with us. And so I, I, I know you're going to enjoy it. It's going to be great. And when I say us, I mean, of course, me. My name is Jason. And with me, as always, my good friend and yours from Chicago, Jimmy Mack. Hey, Jason. Hey, Star Wars fans. The afterglow of Ahsoka. Often I, I refer to our analysis of star wars stuff after they've been released i call it like the fallout <laughs> we're experiencing the fallout but with ahsoka i think uh you know ahsoka recap with kyle newman i i think that attracts a lot of attention i'm certainly looking forward to what kyle has to say because you know it's going to be fueled with uh not only a deep passion for Star Wars and storytelling, but also uh, with a, a, an edge that only his experience as a Hollywood veteran uh, can apply to uh, his analysis of the entire season. So Kyle always blows minds when he starts talking Star Wars, and I'm sure in a few minutes uh, we're going to see that for ourselves here. It's for always sure. great when stops by plus he's got some dungeons and dragons activity going on and uh that's uh, a brand new book, book yeah. here he's gonna be uh talking about lore and legends we'll have more on that with kyle very proud of him though i mean writing a book I i've heard so many authors say uh boy it feels great to have written a book not so great to write a book yes. they, they all and so anybody that that does that has my respect i'm, yeah. I'm much more yeah. Jim, I'm much more comfortable with the spoken word, the written word, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, anything that requires less typing or writing. Uh, Jason Swank signed him up for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why he uh, has a history as a crooner. A lot of that, people don't realize that. But Jason learn to croon. a crooner. You know, requires no actually playing of an instrument or anything. No, it's no, way, you save that know? for the real musicians. You just stand up and you... Uh, yeah, exude all your charisma. You know, you were talking about Kyle blowing our minds. Uh, our our listeners blow our minds all the time, and the folks that are participate in our chats for our live shows blow our mind. And oh, and yeah. and those that they go above and beyond, and they do the super chat thing. And unlike uh, some shows, uh, we just don't have time to get to all of the chats. But we commit to making sure that anything we don't get to on the live show we will do on the podcast and that's what we're going to do so we have some uh, leftover super chats so we're going to warm them up here in the rfr microwave make sure they're good and hot we've got this one from john david john has been in so many of our after show chats great guy uh he says these are all about our uh, our analysis of ahsoka part eight he says i agree jason it's a disservice to the story a balin 
and Ray if they just write him out. What do you all think about Nick Offerman or Stephen Lang? So this is about whether or not they should recast um, Ray Stevenson as as Balin Skull. Uh, Jimmy Mack had a great theory about how they might sort of uh, take the where they might take the story to give Shin what might have been Balin's story in season yeah. two. I re-listened to the show uh, yesterday, and I was like, well, "Okay, I could actually, I could actually see that happening." I'm for, I'm on team recast. No disrespect to Ray Stevenson, I, I want to see where this character goes. But uh, Jim, your 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 idea was fairly compelling to say, you know, maybe she's on a she's on a quest to find Balin, and she finds that Balin didn't uh, f fulfill the quest, and she yes. picks up where he left off. Yeah, she finds his remains. Yeah. It's like going and on a treasure hunt. It. Yes. And you find she, all the people that were hunting the treasure before you. Yes. And and he's the last body she comes across. So she has to endure some of the challenges he did too. Right. And she succeeds where he didn't and somehow is able to go on beyond the, the furthest point he made it and get to this power that he had convinced himself exists on the planet. And so uh, I, I, you know, you use the tools that are in the toolbox and Shin is, it's perfect. The way the story was left off at the end of season one, it's perfect to slot her in to continue Balin's quest and also let us see and understand exactly what is the root of this journey. What, where is this all coming from? What, what is Balin searching out? We, we've had tantalizing hints and clues along the way. But with the way the story has been structured, it's pretty damn flexible. You can go in any direction, any direction. All speculation is welcome as we exist within the fallout of Ahsoka. There, I used it. The fallout the of fallout. Ahsoka. I, I just, I mean, it just sounds so great. Imperial but, um, Cargo Bay says uh, not to focus on practicality, but how did Ezra make it through hyperspace with a tiny ship and nowhere to meet them if there was an emphasis of him lost? I, I, I think Imperial oh, Cargo Bay is 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 wondering how he got to Hera and the New Republic there on home one. How did he find home one with a, with a tiny ship and nowhere to meet them? Uh, well, I don't think it would be that, that difficult uh, when home one is a focal point in the New Republic to find yeah. where it's located. They're not exactly hiding. They're not rebels anymore hiding out. It's, they are the government. They are uh, the uh, the officials, right? They are the law enforcement, all of that. So jumping on the comms, I don't think would be that much of a stretch. And, of course, Ezra was a pretty high-ranking rebel by the time he got pulled out into the other galaxy. So when he was flying in, as if you notice closely, his Imperial shuttle is flanked by two A-wings. So Ezra had to pass through a security checkpoint at some some point on his journey toward the home one. And, you know, it was probably one of those situations where, like, it's an older code, sir, but it checks <laughs> out. Right. You know, he, he was using some old code and uh, he was able to get there. Um, so I, I really believe that's the type of situation that went down with uh with ezra as far as traveling through hyperspace i don't think he took off in that shuttle until they reached the no right, star yeah, wars galaxy I, yes I, yeah 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 so, uh i didn't catch the the a wings flanking him that's that's very yes cool. i've got a so shot he right clearly here. had to pass through a security checkpoint yeah and uh and 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 the a wings were the ones there yeah, uh, they yeah they weren't just going to let any ship just show up on uh, right. On it's an one imperial store. vessel, right? And that's what set off the uh, commander of the home one in the very first episode when Balin and Shin landed. They were flying an imperial vessel, right? 
but using a Jedi code. Didn't he call him like Imperial Trash or something like that in that first yeah, episode? Yeah. Yeah. He thought he knew it all, that guy. Uh, here's Tanner. Tanner, excuse me. Uh, Tanner, also a uh, a familiar name in the chat. Tanner, Ooh, yeah, Tanner is- was my favorite of the bad news bears. Tanner, that foul mouth little, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> oh, I love. Oh, I forgot his name was Tanner. Okay, uh, who Tanner Yang, Boyle? Who Yang is the preserved consciousness of Mangold's first Jedi? Thoughts? Love RFR. Ooh. So we know that Mangold's film if it ever happens, is really about the first Jedi, sort of the prehistory of the Force and all of that. Yes. Um, I do think that Hu Yang will be a fixture in that. I absolutely do. I think he's the... He's, he's got to be. Yeah. Uh, it, it would make absolute sense to give us uh, a handle, like a, you know, at least give us one familiar character in that in that era. So Hu Yang is is perfect, and he's certainly proven to be a fan favorite in this series. Most everyone really seems to like Hu Yang. Yeah, he's among all the characters in this series, which to me, this series populated with the best kind of characters to move Star Wars storytelling along for the next decade. And who Yang would be part of it. As a matter of fact, he would be the one who would be present in multiple time periods. Yes. Which is important because George Lucas always said the Star Wars story story the saga was told from the perspective of r2 and 3po now you have another droid there who's recording time who existed long before r2 and 3po so again it's carrying on with a certain tradition of storytelling to have the consistency of droid counterparts in various sagas you had r2 and 3po in the original trilogy and in the prequels But the prequels really presented us an origin, at least for 3PO. R2, his history is vast. Maybe he's as old as Hu Yang. I don't think the R2 units are that old. I think they're, you know, they're spinoffs of the R1 units, which were tall and uh, not as cute or expressive (laughs) (laughs) or as mobile (laughs) or as exciting. Uh, Nikki Nikki says, uh, next season, will we see Thrawn twirling his new blue mustache as he spins in his chair with a cat in his lap? Uh, so Nikki Nikki in the chat, I know that she's uh, not all that enthralled with Thrawn, Thrawn we could say. Thrawn, Thrawn. Uh, and, and, and he is proving to be, I think, for some, you know, you know, for some people, man, they just they are Thrawn fans. They loved yes. him in the novels. They loved him in Rebels, and they're just thrilled to see him in live action. I get a kick me. out of seeing him in live action. That's but me. I, but I don't think he's a. I don't think that he is a. Uh, it's not a Vader. He's not a Vader or Palpatine caliber villain no. for Star Wars. For me, he's not. He hasn't earned anything. In Rebels, at least, he earned some amount of terror because. He was more fully fleshed out. They would show him in combat sequences. He had hand-to-hand combat with Kallus up in Ezra's tower. So he he was putting his money in his mouth more often in Rebels than he ever has in Ahsoka. I think it's important to establish what kind of threat he is, but I think we just have to roll with the fact that this guy has had a pretty stellar military career and he's a known genius and with the resources of night mother magic and an army of the undead you know now yeah. he's presenting a threat <laughs> yeah and he's he sure a star is. destroyer too you can't forget a star destroyer me that's bad news in the star wars galaxy it's not like any of them should should be ignored. The threat of them should never be ignored. So yeah, Thrawn has a, a few lot of things damage. going for him. He has, yeah. he has a lot more going for him now than he did at the start of the series when I was feeling a, a lot of the threat of Thrawn was being overblown and unearned by the character himself because um, it's just a mere rumor he's going to come back. Well, he's but carrying seems- an army potentially of yeah. undead uh, witch ancestors. Lord knows, yes, the havoc that they're going to be able to wreak once they're on Dathomir and if resurrected. That is, if that is indeed what the cargo is, 
True. We don't know. Could be we best star. I give your speculation five dancing thrones. <laughs> five dancing thrones. Our buddy Suds popped up just to say, hey, guys, just wanted to pop in and say I love the show overall. Really enjoyed your discussion of it. Keep up the fantastic work. Uh, Suds is one of the good ones for sure. And here's oh, Chris. Yeah. Look for Suds hosting RFR Q&A with me on October 30th. What's the topic? Be, Do you know? Whatever Suds wants to whatever talk Suds about. That's what I love okay. about the Q&A. A lot of times I don't know what I'm getting into. Sometimes they make me do homework and I prep. But mm. sometimes I don't know until the mic fires They up. spring it on so you? They spring it on me. And sometimes, sometimes those are the most revealing conversations. Here's Chris. Chris says, do you prefer to see Anakin as a flashback, hologram, or force ghost? Dave Filoni replies, how about all three? <laughs> that is so true great yeah. observation yeah yes flashback Anakin hologram a, and force ghost all oh three. wow <laughs> what, what a wonderful way of summing up the way anakin skywalker was rolled out in this series which was nothing but a big win every time anakin was incorporated into the series it was beautiful. It was so well executed. It was done with confidence and style. And and Anakin had a, a charisma. The, the chemistry he had with Ahsoka, especially mm, the young mm -hmm. actress. Right. Ariana Greenblatt. That was magic. I mean, just that's some great stuff. And I loved it at the end there where he's looking over Ahsoka and Sabine. And it's interesting. People are saying, well, He's popping in on his apprentice Ahsoka. Meanwhile, his son is floundering, trying to reestablish the Jedi. And he's his training is is while he may be considered a Jedi Knight because Yoda said you have to face Vader and then a Jedi Knight you will be yada, yada, yada. But there's still a lot of holes in his education that need to be filled. And a visit from his pops would uh, that'd be great. Now, Anakin does appear to Luke in the new expanded universe novels in that uh, shadow of the Sith novel. And that's some of the best parts of that book. And it's really fulfilling as a fan to have to experience that. But our buddy, our buddy, Dave Myatt, star Wars expert, the guy who wrote the book on uh, the vintage collection, he uh, what's it? Do you know the name of that book? I got it over there. Oh, I can't get right over there, here. but so, so talking, Dave, I'll grab it. I mean, he's he's one of the most renowned Star Wars collecting experts out there and a renowned expert on Star Wars itself. And he revealed something in the RFR Facebook group that I never really considered. He said that a force spirit can only, it must be a master appearing to a Padawan. It, that's how it, it happens. So I started to review, well, when have we seen Force Ghosts? And I thought of Luke and Ben. And I mean, you know, for all practical purposes, Luke was uh, Ben's Padawan. So that adds up. Um, it's on my also, nightstand. <laughs> I just realized it's on my nightstand. I keep it next to my nightstand. Oh, Liz Swank looking at pictures of old Toys. action figures before he <laughs> drifts off to La La Land. But yeah. what, what Maya had told me was that a master only appears as a force ghost to an apprentice. That's the only connection that happens. So it's, it's like the, you know, the sender and the receiver, they both have to have that connect. I don't know that I like rules like that though. Well, I don't think, I don't think that rule actually adds up because I question the voice of Qui-Gon and the knowledge that Yoda was communicating with the spirit of Qui-Gon was Yoda ever Qui-Gon's master? Well, yes. Think, when he was a, when he was a young, when he was a young Padawan, Yoda right, so was they all, all have of to their, pass through Yoda at some right. point. So he's everyone's master. Yeah, he's the elementary school teacher. Okay. But I mean, that's not a master Padawan relationship. No, that's no, a whole different I, thing. Sure, no, you passed through Yoda's education, but that's that. not a master Padawan scene. Yeah. So I know, you know what? Dooku was Qui Gon's master. Here's here's what I don't understand. Why 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 do these people assume that Anakin isn't appearing to both? 
He's omnipotent. He has the ability yes. to appear like his power is unfettered. It's not like he can't be two places at once. Uh, I, I just, I just don't think they're mutually exclusive is what I'm trying to say. If he's with Ahsoka, that doesn't mean he can't be with his son, Luke. Let's have some star Wars live action situation where Anakin Skywalker, the spirit of Anakin appears before Luke Skywalker, deep fake Luke, I'd Ghost Annie, deep fake Luke, together. That's what I want. Yeah, no, I think it, I think that would be great. I want to see that. Uh, so here is uh, Chris. Chris says uh, this is Chris Clendenning. Uh, chut chut, late to the show finale felt like an all felt like an opening to all new Star Wars to explore new shows, new timelines, new characters. Star Wars colon Paradia. Soon, he's saying that like oh wow could we get star wars paradia as a new show um no i there's 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 no argument that feloni really did open up the universe to uh, jim what you were speculating this could be star wars for the next decade there's so yeah. much track that he has uh so much space that he's opened up so yeah there's no question about that it's it that that is fantastic that is world building at its best its finest and i'm all for it great on Dave for doing that yeah I love that aspect of Ahsoka I love the characters I love the casting I love the magic I love the lightsaber duels I love the dog fights just the the, the color palettes the wipes the classic Kurosawa wipes that Filoni employs there's just so many right ingredients of the Star Wars stew that a gourmet chef like Filoni used so masterfully in this show. And I've had my beefs with the storytelling, and I'm sure we'll be discussing this more as the show goes on. And 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 we want to do it in like where all of our comments come out of a place of passion. And I know I've been very passionate in that regard <laughs> during the after shows. And I think some people are confused. Like they think I didn't like the Ahsoka show. <laughs> I I really, really like the Ahsoka show. Like, I think it's some of the best Star Wars Disney. It's going to give us a lot to talk about. And as hosts of a podcast, that's what we want is Star Wars. That gives us a lot to talk about. For sure. For sure. Okay. Who's next? We got uh, Chen Puka. Chen Puka says Ezra, Sabine, Ahsoka, Grogu, Jude Law, and Luke. Loving all this Jedi lore. Disney, if you can recast Han, you can recast Luke and Leia in Filoni's movie. Stop being cowards. Much love, guys. <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, they recasted Han Solo in that movie, and it was a box office bomb on Star Wars terms. So. I, I think uh, they're going to heavily consider that. And then since that film came out in 2018, we saw the rise of the deep fake technology, which Lucasfilm embraced immediately. I mean, even to the point they were recreating people as CGI in Rogue One, where you had Tarkin and Leia. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the deep fake. The deep fake is where they actually access legitimate photos of yeah it's the indiana jones actors. stuff yes i mean yeah. that's deep fake technology that's not cgi recreation obviously cgi is involved as a tool as is uh these ai tools and all of this other stuff that just is beyond my comprehension on how it all works but that's a big difference between creating animating completely younger versions of people or, 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 you know, resurrecting dead actors via CGI. I think, yeah. Deep I, fake, deep yeah. fake is actually the, the actual image of the person. Yeah. Yeah. I, I personally don't think that, that that is necessarily a sustainable model for indefinite. I, I, th I don't think that it is going to serve much better than glorified cameos. I can't see now I could be wrong, but right. I can't see a deep fake character anchoring a series or anchoring a film yet. I'm not saying yes. they can't get there yet. I also I don't you know the ethics of it, that's another that's another story. I don't yes. really care, honestly. Um 
about that, I just, to me, I think it would be neater and cleaner to recast, but I don't care. Just tell great stories. Um, and you're going to run out of excuses if you just skate around the characters. Oh, what? They're, they're in the bathroom? Oh, okay. Oh, they're, oh they're, they're on the phone. Oh, they're on the phone. We can't. All right. Here's Drew Peterson. Uh, Drew says, sad that Ahsoka is over, but now we can look forward to what's next. What's yeah. it going to be? Skeleton crew? Finale was great. Proud Force Ghost Anakin. So that's the speculation, Jim. What is next? Um, we know that, first of all, we know that Andor Season 2, we have not received an update in terms of its uh, broadcast schedule. It is next summer. Everything's until we hear flux. otherwise. Uh, they were done shooting. They were just doing post-production on it. So I don't think the strike is going to hamper that too much. So I think that is a lock for next summer. But what about before that summer? Is it going to be Skeleton Crew or could it be Acolyte? Skeleton Crew is in the can. We the only know thing that holding sure. that up is the actor's strike because they want Jude Law out there on the promotional tour okay. selling that sucker. And um, so we need the actor's strike to get resolved to make Jude available to do this. Because we've already heard studios crying about films ending up in the red because they weren't allowed to promote it properly by having their superstars out on the, the talk show circuit, getting the word out about the right. film. I don't know how much that really comes into play. I, I don't think I've ever been like, man, I was really on the fence about that movie, but then I saw Adam Sandler on Conan and I <laughs> bought a ticket right away. Usually, you know, if you're going to want to go see a movie, you, you do. You, don't but you know what? I mean, the, the rule of marketing is that you need to hear about it seven times, seven times. Swang knows he's a marketing genius. So I don't seven know times. Uh, if you're on the look, if you're now, if you're a diehard fan of whatever it is that all bets are off, but you, you take a normie. Uh, they need that maybe that Adam Sandler appearance on Conan is the fifth and then they see the trailer the next day that's the sixth and then you know maybe they see the ad in a uh, on Facebook and that's the seventh that seems to be the calculus involved so those those PR appearances are important uh, but I'm I'm with you Jim like I always feel like I'm numb or immune to that sort of thing like I'm yeah. immune to marketing or PR it probably right. works. I mean, you but you work. You've worked your whole life in the radio business, so you've been a vehicle for public relations. I've worked in marketing my whole professional life, so I kind of know how the sausage is made. But yeah, you know, know, we're probably at the end of the day, we're probably just as susceptible as anybody. Of course, we are. Usually, it's a commercial or a trailer that sells me on it. Yeah, show me. Don't tell me. Show me. Right. So I don't need the star power. I think that's a little over exaggerated and over evaluated. And well, you know, there used to be a day like if you I'm guessing here, but I'll bet that you probably remember your dad watching John Wayne movies on TV. Oh, God, like a junkie. Are you kidding me? He still is. That it way. didn't matter what the movie was. It was like he's clicking. He's doing the thing on the clicker. And he's yeah. like, oh, it's a John Wayne movie. Men of a certain age. Men of a certain. It's what I call the Duke syndrome, <laughs> where they're they're flipping channels and it's just like, oh, the Duke. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're locked in for the next two hours. But there was a time when there you didn't care what the movie was. It was like, oh, gee, it's a it's a John. A John Wayne is probably the most emblematic, I think, of that of that syndrome, as you call it. Absolutely. Uh, there, there are other actors. I think Harrison Ford was there for a good long time in the 70s and 80s. Arnold. Arnold Schwarzenegger is probably next to the Duke. Did you see the new Schwarzenegger? movie? They don't even know the name of it. I remember when The Predator uh, came out and it was just it was the new Schwarzenegger movie. Did you see the new it, Schwarzenegger? It movie? would always say Schwarzenegger bigger than the logo <laughs> of the film itself. <laughs> That's right. Well, thanks, everybody, for the super chats. The super chats are much, 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 much appreciated. And uh, it is our commitment to uh, do our very best to get uh, through each and every one, even if we don't do it on the live show. And uh, we also appreciated all your phone calls. So I'm excited for the next round of after shows 
Fear not. Just because there's not a new Star Wars show doesn't mean we're not going to be doing anything live on the YouTube. So make sure that you're uh, tuned in each and every week here on the podcast and also subscribe to us on YouTube and we'll let you know when we're going to go live. And make sure you're on Patreon because I have a sense that if next live show we do, it's probably going to be a Patreon exclusive. So you're yes. not going to get the link to join us live unless you're on Patreon. Get full access to RFR only on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Rebel Force Radio. You may fire when ready. Patreon.com slash Rebel Force Radio. going, Master? For a drink. Sorry about the mess. You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. All right, he is back. Director, producer, author. We just call him friend and fan of Star Wars, of course, our pal Kyle Newman. Welcome back to RFR, Kyle. How are you guys? Good to be back. Yeah. Got my, I got my Lucasfilm Limited shirt. I Losers love that. Been selling this wrong for how long? Just it's Lucasfilm, <laughs> not Lucasfilm. Stop. It's 2023. <laughs> Make it end. But I do want a, a Dave Filoni series shirt to kind of combat all the other paraphernalia that's out there. Yeah, to, Dave to doesn't really have. Legacy. I guess with this, with the beginning of a or the end of a soak those end credits. He's kind of got like a branded a Dave, you know, Dave Filoni, yeah. written by Dave Filoni. I think that should be his look. <laughs> the Game uh, of Thrones end credits. <laughs> is that what is that what it is? Uh, it, is no, it just is it, it heavily it, influenced it by like the Game of Thrones opening. Is what it feels oh, like. okay. It just feels does it feel not feel like Star Wars music to you? It's great music. It just feels a little. Oh, I like the music. Well, I Mac and I were talking a, a, a while back about the Ahsoka theme. I her theme song hasn't like soaked into my brain, but I think I'm hearing it, and I think I'm hearing the Mandalorian theme or something. I I, I just need to sit down and listen to it in isolation. Do 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 do. Do, 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 do. No, that's not it. That's Mando. <laughs> you know what? It's not this, Mando. The Kevin, the Kevin Kinder music is Star Wars. It's awesome. It's oh, it refreshing is to have Star Wars scored music back in Star Wars. What a novelty. I don't dislike the Mandalorian music. I think there's a lot of great spots to it. It's a cool theme. It's used really well, and it was a breath of fresh air at the time, but it's nice to have classic Star Wars music scored mm. by aficionado, aficionado of John Williams. Well, you yeah. like the orchestral stuff because that's more traditional. And I remember, uh, I think we were all sort of griping about the way Kiner was scoring Clone Wars in the first season because he was under the directive of George Lucas to do anything but <laughs> orchestral Star Wars music. He's a, yeah, make sure it sounds like anything but John Williams. But then they gradually found the right tone and the right flavor and and kiner made it work and i think if anybody yeah. would f be uh, great filling the shoes of john williams it is kevin kiner but with ludwig i feel like the compositions he created just meshed so well with the mandalorian yeah. character himself right and, and and also the the sergio leone western vibe totally Yes. Unique instrumentation. There's an exoticness to it. Totally, uh, it's it totally suits that show well and that character. Yes. Well, I think that's you know what is on a lot of Star Wars fans' mind these days is when you have something that was quite bold and fresh, like The Mandalorian was, but it had enough of those touchstones that you knew what universe you were in, and then you get something like Ahsoka which just, you know, hits you over the head with Star Wars imagery and references and lore. Uh, and then you got this Andor thing that's kind of out there. It's really odd to be in a, in a single fandom that has so many different ways that it's expressing itself now. And I think that, that fans are finding it. It's like fans think they have to pick a side, like I'm team Andor or no, I'm Ahsoka all the way or, it's a really, really odd time it's, for fan cohesion. 
it's a problem with our culture at large. You're forced yeah. to pick a side. That's it. Nuance is gone. Mm. And RFRs, mm. the place where Star Wars fans can still come and talk. Well, thank you. Yes, talk yes. detail. You know, yeah. I find that when I look at other stuff, it's so polarizing. And if you're not this, you're out. And if you're not this, you're out. And we have always, every time I've come on the show, we've always had healthy, constructive analysis and discussions of of live action and animated shows for how long decades have been coming on and we always talk and i'm always this was great this wasn't i don't like this this could have been stronger um back to the beginning of clone wars from the clone wars movie onward we've always been it's been constructive criticism and it's not nothing is tear it down it's always like i would like to see a little more of this or why didn't they do this it's you know i mean it's not hyperbole it's actual criticism based on years decades of of understanding, analysis, professional experience. You know, that's why it's it's I'm excited to talk to you guys about the show because there's actually a lot to dive into and analyze. There absolutely is. And with the season finale of uh, Ahsoka last week, uh Kyle, how did it how did it hit you? You know, the 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 phrase is did it stick the landing? Uh how do you think it did there in its last 43 minutes? You know what? The The show just got progressively better for me, and I don't think it was just me being acclimated to it. I think it actually got progressively better. Um, And a big big picture analysis, this is Star Wars. This is really fantastic, wonderful world building. It's immense. Uh, There is new lore galore. It embraces being Star Wars. It's not embarrassed by it. I feel like Andor sometimes is a little embarrassed. Like, we got to show you guys two stormtroopers. We're so sorry. Get them out of here. (laughs) I'm sorry. There's a TIE fighter. We had to put it in. So sorry. We're so sorry. But let's get back to it. You know what I mean? And yeah, I love Andor. Yeah. But that's one of Andor's hangups. It's afraid to just have the balls to be Star Wars. This embraces it, but it also has some shortcomings in the writing, which I think are it's one of the challenges, you know. But for me, it smells like Star Wars. It feels like Star Wars. Dave Filoni is extrapolating. He's even doubling down on some of the biggest concepts, world between worlds, and apparently now Mortis, Mortis. bold Jeez. stuff. Yeah. And I would say this show handled Anakin and Vader better than anyone since GL did it in 2005 Revenge of the Sith. I, I mean, I can't agree with a that better more. handling where he did not fear Anakin and Hayden and anything. He said, this is a, this is a proper tool in my arsenal. It's Anakin, it's Darth Vader, and God damn it, he's going to be in Star Wars. Why would he not be? This is his right. student and the stuff they did with masters and apprentices. It was great. Not that seven minute garbage they tried to tell us was a was a was a special, you know, the Master and Apprentice episode itself. Not that oh, right, right. Five you know minute like don't forget to drink your Ovaltine promo thing. They <laughs> they squeezed out before they. That was oh, garbage. Yeah, that was the, what they call the promo piece, Master and Apprentice. But yeah, that was like okay. A, yeah, that was very canned. Very. I was like, very oh corporate. God, I've all this before. I was so psyched for an episode, you know, and it was like. Yeah, behind the scenes stuff, but the show itself, not that it has a weak setup, but what it didn't do was reestablish its characters. And you have to do that. You have to connect. Even if you think we know the characters, you still have to connect the audience to the soul of the character. It can't be a mystery within the first minute of meeting Luke Skywalker. I know that he is, he is distressed. He yes. is unhappy where he is. I know the situation with his parents. I know he's restless. I know his challenge is self, be- his own self belief beyond the galaxy's issues. I was lost a bit with these characters. Not that I didn't like the character. Not that I didn't like the casting. Not that I didn't like what Dave then did with these people or how these episodes were directed by the other great directors that came in. I was just yearning for something basic. You watch Andor, and you know what every character wants. What are they craving? What makes them tick? What is their weak? What is their shortcoming? He shoots a guy and you know, he has a soul of gold, but in over his head because he did this thing. And that is the catalyst for everything. And I was left wanting the catalyst for all these characters. I ultimately got explanations. The explanations are fine and they, they patch things up. But the biggest picture for me was when Anakin Skywalker comes back and he teaches her in the world between worlds, I wanted a simplicity. I loved it. I loved it. I'm not saying I didn't like it. I loved it. But when Yoda's like, do or do not, there is no try. That's stuff you bring with you for the rest of your life. When it says what's in the cave, only what you bring with you. Mm -hmm. You take that with you for the rest of your life. It sticks with you. You get chills. 
I left that episode, I still didn't know exactly what Ahsoka, what he taught her, because I didn't know from episode chapter one what she needed and what she wanted, what made Ahsoka this version of Ahsoka tick. And that is just basic, primal stuff that you need as an audience member. It can't be something you fill in the gaps later. You then establish it, and then for the rest of those eight episodes, you explore it. You push the boundaries of it. You test the parameters of it. Is she fulfilling that? She's almost there. She's not. She breaks down. It's hard for her, but she's going to get it this time. And then she emerges from that world between worlds. And then she falls out of the sky right next to this guy who killed her in the other galaxy. And she's got to face him. And I wanted then her to exemplify the element, the thing that she got taught by Anakin. You know, so it's those things, those structural things. I'm like, these, the opportunities were there. It just needed a little more massaging, a little more nuancing. I'm not saying this mm-hmm. show is mediocre, but Star Wars cannot be mediocre. The mm-hmm. danger of Star Wars television is television as a mm-hmm. format is yeah. mediocre. We as right. fans can't ever accept mediocre. Do you think right. that with television, there's a there's an element of, oh, that's okay. We'll get it right next week. Is of that course. is that what of sets course. They're, they're Or next season, or they used mm-hmm. to do that with television. You know? And the way they shoot these my things. Fear, right. yeah. That was my fear when Star Wars was announced on television, is that can it ever live up to the standards that of Star Wars where it should break boundaries. It should yeah. be a paper. It is the gold standard of, of science fiction, fantasy entertainment, period. It is the gold standard of IP. Let's make sure it stays there. And I'll, there's a lot of moments in this where Dave just blew my mind with stuff, stuff that was so visually um, refreshing and exciting and new. And I love stuff with the, yeah. with the whales and coming yeah, into the hyperspace the and all these things. I was just like amazing. I loved Hu Yang. I loved seeing uh, the chemistry with, with um, Ahsoka. It's just, it was, for me, it was just some moments in writing that really let me down, which then have these long-term mm-hmm. ramifications of how I feel about the show. So you say, how do I feel about it? I got to the end of it. I loved it. I liked, I loved the way it ended. I like where it went. I like that he's saying, I'm going to go here. I, uh, but I also know it could be more. You know, I also know it could have been more. So did it stick the landing? Yes. But the landing, I ended up expecting it to hit. The bar was a little lower by the time I saw how things were set up. And it's a choice. Maybe I. Maybe it's just a choice. Maybe it's stylistic. I, I mean, personally, I would say I want to know what makes Sabine's heart beat. I want to know the soul of Sabine. I don't want to be left wanting and being curious and then stuck in a scene like in episode seven where she just turns to us and was like, it's complicated. You know, yeah. that's like, no, that, that's unforgivable. You can't do that. You cannot hmm. do that. You just can't do that. Um, So I think the after effects of of the absence of these things, like one, I wrote this down, one, each character should have had a scene, like at the beginning where I just understand, like Elspeth could have woken up from in in like in a snap, her eyes awake and she hears voices of night mothers in her head. We don't know who they are. She doesn't know who they are. Someone's reaching from the beyond calling her. You know what I mean? And then you're like, whoa, what's happening here? This is mystical. This is strange. Thrawn opens up a tomb. You don't even know what's thrown. It's a guy. You see blue ears and you follow this person into the tomb and he awakens these night mothers. And you're like, where the F am I? What is going on? What is yeah. happening? So like yeah. the, I want to know. I had no idea what that Peridia planet was. I had no, I still don't really know what it was. Someone's like, it's a graveyard planet. I was like, should have told me that. I have no idea what that is. I don't get it. I don't know what the culture there was. I find out in dialogue, he awoken these people. But by the end, I was like, where were these things? Like Shin and Balin, their dynamic was, you know, it was cool, but it was never really grounded or clear to the point where when he turns to her and says, you, you're on your own. You're not my apprentice anymore. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> this, I, I was wait, right where, with you. Mind, where did this come from? You know what I mean? I had no yeah. idea. And it wasn't even, it wasn't, it wasn't percolating in their dynamic. It wasn't premeditated. There was nothing. She almost looked at him sometimes with a morale or moral code questioning some of the decisions he was making. Yes. I interpreted it as, um, and then he looks at her and it was blocked like the freaking Ed Sullivan show. And she doesn't even be like, what are you talking about? What are you, there was, it was supposed to be like, Oh, we know that inside she knew that. And I was like, well, this does none of this rings true. Especially after the previous episode, he's like the enemy of my enemy is our friend. you know, yeah. he was all in. And then and we see him. He's like, yeah, you're out. I'm going to go over here. And then I have no idea what he's hearing or experiencing or feeling. You know, maybe they could have, the people that they find Ezra with could have been at, in touch or experiencing a manifestation of what he ultimately is on a quest for. 
He's on a quest. Mm. This guy's committed to a quest. Like they're the connect. All the elements are there to have this thing tied together more. Um, so that was one of the big thing. You know, I never want to see a stomach stab ever again. Yeah. Oh it's my god. Elizabeth coming back. She got a stomach stab. Is, is she coming back? I don't know. No, the she thing. Got a stomach but- slice. There's a slice. slice. There's a slice. Yeah. The the the, the, the just poking right through. That's okay as long as it's clean and it avoids all the internal organs. Or if you have two stomachs, somebody told me, that makes you impervious to that kind of thing. So all Qui-Gon had to do was just kind of inch over just a little bit. Same thing with Han Solo. Just inch and be like, oh, you got me. You got me. Well, maybe Harrison knew that. And that's why he insisted they blow, you know, he fall off the bridge and then blow up the planet just to be sure I mean, that's Grand Admiral Thrawn tactics to get rid of an enemy right there. Stab him, <laughs> chuck him over a bridge, and then blow up the planet. Kyle, now, you, you guys, doing- we watch. Sorry, I was going to say, we watch every Rebel, episode of Rebels. Like, yeah. we all talked about it. I watched it multiple times. I was still kind of at a loss with some of these things, the, the entry points of characters. Yes. Um, and that that was something I was, I was challenged by. And I, I felt it hampered it. I just wanted clarity. I think good storytelling is needs to be clear. Lucas is the master of clear. He, you know what it is. You know where they stand. It might have been a fine storytelling technique to introduce new characters with all of these mysteries about their past, and then they could gradually fill in. Yeah. But for characters like Ahsoka, who we've known for 15 years, there are just these vast amounts of time in her history that we are still totally in the dark about after season one has wrapped up. I get very frustrated with that. So you're echoing a lot of my sentiment yeah. about the season, and, and you're articulating and, it very well. But And Thrawn. Jimmy Thrawn, like, did you know, like, I, I mean, one of my favorite things ever is Heir to the Empire. Those books, I read them every year. Oh, yeah. I, I think we've talked about them nonstop. Yes, I love them. Years. And, mm-hmm. and I, have, I have issues with Thrawn as a character, but I think, you know, Dave's handled them really well previously. But in this, I had no idea why they are not telling the average person, let's just say my mom, she's watching it. She would be like, yeah. what, what, what's going on? What? Who? What? You know? You have to play to the mom. You have to play to your cousin that doesn't watch Star Wars. Who, who, what do they know about Thrawn? Someone needed to say, like, why is he dangerous? He's the guy that can make five destroyers as effective as 50. The guy will cut our head off. You know what I mean? Like, where is the dread? And they're just saying yes. Thrawn's dangerous, Thrawn's coming. But I, it's not manifested emotionally in anybody. No one's saying, oh, my God, remember what he did at this battle of this? And when this, and everyone's got to, like, oh, my God, they sink their heads like – Holy crap, that's bad. If he's back, it's, you know what I mean? Where's the gravity? The yes. freaking gravity. That's what I want. That's what they need. Thrawn well, has to have gravity to him. These characters need to earn these reputations. And yeah. I don't get the sense that they're earning a lot of this stuff that gets set up in Ahsoka. But what's he been doing for 10 years, Jimmy? Do you know what he's been doing for 10 years, Thrawn? How does he have enough fuel to even stay in the air for 10 years? Like, well, I, I know it's maybe it took him that long to wake up the night mothers. Maybe they're very heavy sleepers. <laughs> like what is that? What, what the dynamic? I don't, I still left this series. I'm thinking of this now. I don't know the dynamic between Thrawn and Ezra. I don't know. Have they, were they in conflict? Is the reason his hard troops are diminished and all battered because of Ezra? Why are they so battered? Maybe Thrawn says it in the dialogue where he realizes that the reason he's trapped out there is because he was bested by a Jedi, and he said he vowed never again. So I don't think he messes with Ezra as long as Ezra is not messing with him. I think so that's they're in a stalemate. Down. But then why does Ezra have dog tags galore making up his wardrobe trooper dog tags? So well, clearly those, those bandits bandits are roaming the plains or whatever, you know? They're, they're out there. I just there, wanted so. to know. I wanted to know that this place was three-dimensional. I wanted right. to know that those 10 years – we're three dimensional and real. Not that there was an idea of ten years. I oh, they gave you. him what a beard. Is the dynamic of this. They gave him a beard. Jason <laughs> says they gave him a beard. That's got to mean something. Maybe he's like not in touch with the force. Maybe he's like a drunken master. You know, I look. Like, he went this monk direction. Yeah, right. And then the next episode, they they go the monk direction, right? Yeah. And the next episode, he's pointing his thing. He's assembling a saber, and he's all like compelled to have a saber again. And you're like, wait. So I thought he went the. I don't need the force. The force is my ally. 
it would have been cool if that scene with him and Sabine, like, I don't want the saber. And she's like, I don't want the saber. It's like, no, you, I gave you the saber. You take the saber. And they're fighting, and nobody wants the saber, or they and they, they pass the saber between each other almost reluctantly as someone needs it, and mm-hmm. they don't want the saber. But it, they set it up like he doesn't need a saber anymore, and the next episode he's all about a saber. So it's like, make a choice, commit to the choice, and then make that part of the character, make that part of the fun. Don't just make it for a scene. That's got to be who he is. Like, I would have loved to see Ezra as a guy. He gets there. Either he's in deep conflict with Ron. He's like, go back. No, this guy's a nightmare. Like, we got to stop him. And she's like, and he, then by stopping him here, he gets pulled back there. Like, he doesn't want to go back. The irony. Or he's like, we haven't talked. I haven't seen that guy in six years or a stormtrooper. You know, we're, it's like a truce. I'm, you know what I mean? There, I don't know what happened. And I needed to know. And she needed to say. What the hell have you been doing for 10 years? Mm. Like, these are the basic conversations that are missing. I'm not saying I yeah. don't like it. I like what's there. But there's also things missing. Yes. I don't want to find out about it in a goddamn book. Right, I right. It, to it, see it, it in my show. It, all, it. Seems, all, it all seems rather half-baked and undercooked. But So recognizing there, there are faults with this, let's, let's talk about the lore that – that we can analyze as true experts of star Wars. So the three of us, and the question I have for you is this, when Ahsoka was in the world between worlds with Anakin Skywalker, was Anakin a manifestation in her mind, a vision of the force, or was this the spirit of Anakin Skywalker? And I want you to explain why. Uh, I think it was an element of the real spirit of Anakin Skywalker and that is amplified in a unique way because it is the location that is the world between worlds as other places amplify and do things to the force in different ways, such as Mortis or when, you know, Qui-Gon could appear um, as lights versus uh, ghost manifestation, the way Mortis could do something different. I think the world between worlds can do something different. So there's a, there's a truth to what she faced. I don't know if it's, it, I wouldn't say we, and maybe in the spirit form, we don't exist in a single consciousness, but that the essence of Anakin is everywhere. It's permeating everything all at once, and it's pulled forth in the world between worlds based on what she needs. So I wouldn't say, I don't have an exact answer, but in a mystical way, I would say it's not the complete summation of Anakin, that like that's where he is entirely at that moment. Um, but I do think the world between worlds there's some big stuff going on and, and i know the the mortis stuff is very big and i think it's probably good to just go right to it and i think you know she died in the in um mortis and if i'm not mistaken right wasn't she brought back to life by, by the daughter anakin, right yes by the daughter, by the daughter. But, right by by the design well, of anakin, right yeah yes via anakin who is the great right. balancer who is ultimately the person who didn't want to take the role of the father, but ultimately is taking the role of the father. So not that and Ahsoka is special, but because Anakin acting like the God has then imbued her with the essence of sister. It's very mm-hmm. obvious with the bird and everything. She yes. is, that's why She's she sister. literally says we are where we need to be because she is filling the gap of the missing sister. Like she, and that is because Anakin, who is this special figure manifested by the force has put her into that role. It's not because she's, it could have been anybody he saved and imbued with the life force of sister. But that is why Ahsoka then averts death when she fights Darth Vader in Rebels and walks another day. And she emerges from the world. She doesn't die with Balin. She has right. something in her that she doesn't realize in that Gandalf type way where um, she will get that other lease on life. She ex- By saying to Anakin, I want to live, she's basically accepting the mantle acknowledging the mantle of I am the sister. Wow. I Uh, love that. You've made, you've made, yeah, you've made more sense in the last three minutes uh, than, than I think the show did. And (laughs) that's for sure. Well, the show can't can't make those points. Well, no, not, not, not not all of it. Not all of it. That's one of the things we need to interpret it on our own. You know, I, I well, that the series is a lot of fill in the blanks, but things like Mortis and stuff, I think, I think we really should be left on our own to decipher that stuff. That's just my feeling. And the other thing about Ahsoka being the daughter, essentially, and Anakin being the father, that doesn't add up to me. 
Because if anyone should be serving as the daughter, it would be Leia. And if anybody should be serving as the son, it would be Luke. Luke danced with the dark side. And Leia, from what we understand, was only light side influenced. And Anakin, of course, you know, he committed well, to both at certain points right. in his career, so he is the, the only father. one I the only one I think is definitively cast is Ahsoka. Just because she says we are where we need to be, which I think is her inner acknowledgement of the role she is actually the reason she's still alive and the role ah. she is destined to play. Anakin mm-hmm. would not be fill the role of father because he is no longer present. But I do think we're left with speculation, so you do have to talk about it, and it's very tangible. There's giant stone statues. There's a gaping hole missing. She sees the bird thing flying around. The bird thing has been synonymous with sister. Uh, it's literally in the image of sister holding it when you see the the the, the more eye. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and she is then unlike Leia or unlike Luke, she is one that is touched by them. When they were alive, she her essence was touched by sister. Almost like sister's essence was passed to her. She doesn't realize it yet, it's in her blood, but that's the reason she can't she hasn't died yet. Because she really died versus Vader, and she looks like she died when she fell off a cliff with Balin, and she's gotten these extra leases on life, like when Gandalf fell in the Balrog. And you know, Felony, I know Felony's wife is very big into Lord of the Rings, and so you have these monolithic stone statues of gods you know of these greats from a generation past so i like that that level of history imbued on peridia i like that but i didn't understand they didn't do enough to tell me what balin was hearing um yes. and i think it was trying to, to play coy and save it for this final image but um that you have to feel that He's like, do you hear it? And we don't hear anything. Whereas earlier in the season, you know, Jason hears something. He's like, do you hear that? And he, and it's an interesting choice when you have two characters that are hearing something metaphysical and one of them's tangible and one of them we're not privy to. And I, I, I would have liked to see parallels in that and them handled almost equally because ben, he's hearing visions. Elspeth is hearing vision. She heard the sisters call across to her from across the galaxy. Yes. I have no idea. Like they, they anointed her this new role. And then you yeah, like, oh, she's dead. They, if they would have done that in an episode or two, that's one of the best scenes in the whole show. When those yeah. mothers approach her, that stuff was epic. All these scenes in this, in this season were pretty epic. Um, the logic of Thrawn is one of those big things that's, that lets me down. Look, she just got out of the previous episode. Six ships couldn't get her, right? She got into like the bone graveyard and six ships came. Yeah. But he's like, I'm going to say two this time. Yeah, it's like, you just had six couldn't get her. Why are you only saying two? <laughs> and why are you so worried about your troops if you just reanimate them? I don't get it. Like, if they're infinite troops, what's what send them all? Who gives a crap? These are like, these are questions. A, a lot, a, of, so, a lot of. Well, I think that I think the reanimation of the troops was. Uh, I think that was the first time they ever pulled that off. I think. Yes. Yeah. I, I don't because I thought like I they know. were. I thought that they were undead troopers from the very beginning. But, but there's something that Night Sisters have done in Star Wars War all along. They they well they have reanimated the dead. Yeah, they have magic. done that. Yeah, they've imbued Maul and and Savage Press with incredible powers. Yeah, I immediately thought of that. They've imbued Death incredible troopers. powers, tr- bodily it. transforming them into something that they're not. Like, um, with a with a strength and dexterity that was almost impossible considering who they were prior, their statures. So I I didn't think it was that new to Ahsoka. She says that's new, but I, I thought this was par for the course. So I and they look. If they're so beat up, that means they've been through rounds of death or regenerative. Why? Who have they been fighting for 10 years? Why do they look like that if they haven't done that? Like, I, maybe it's a stylistic choice. But but I think it's a thing with, with, this, with those mothers that was so potent. They were well cast. Those were, they were always well directed. That uh, blade of Talzin, the manifestation, the conjuring of that—they really mm-hmm. reminded me of like Dungeons and Dragons, you know, Red Wizards of Thay. They—they they were um, there's an undead quality to them. Yeah, um, 
when they mark her face. All the scenes in this final episode were actually fantastic. I thought things came alive. Like that scene when they're in Huyang's, you know, little workshop and they're moving around and they're cutting to Sabine at the right times with poignancy. Um, there, well, all right, let me ask this. Yeah. There's, there's no question that what Filoni did, I think, with this one season is just blow the doors wide open in the galaxy far, far away. Just blew the doors wide open. How do you then go back? It, it, how do you, how does it not make what happens in the sequel trilogy feel somewhat small in comparison? If you've, if you literally have witches and a former Imperial uh, Grand uh, Admiral coming from another galaxy into the known galaxy <laughs> with this, with this incredible takeover. So and then awesome. all of a sudden, you know, you, you, this all leads up to the sequel trilogy at some point, And you've got uh, the dead emperor from 30 years ago, coming back to life. I, I guess like, how do you not outdo or outshine the shine or do they just, can they not just work? Should they not worry about that? They should just right. I don't think they should tell the yeah. best story they can. I don't think they should because the sequel trilogy is specifically character driven by Ray, and so I don't think it it's worth even getting your panties in a bunch about what happens twenty years into the future down the Star Wars timeline. They'll figure out a way to make it all dovetail in, but I don't think each and every moment or element of- No, 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 no. I'm not talking about each and every moment. I'm not, I'm not talking about each and every moment. No, We're I know, I know that, you're that, not. That, that I know specific. you're not, Jason. I'm just, I, I'm just saying that it seems like yeah. each and every moment has been analyzed by fandom as being a potential mm. clue yes, about where the galaxy true. is heading. Right. Right. So, no, so I'm not I'm not necessarily, you know, um, talking about what you said, but I'm, I'm just I'm seeing a lot of things, a lot of yeah. uh, knee jerk reactions to things. But you bring up a point. <laughs> yes. So you brought up a point which I didn't really think about. And it's this, the reanimation um, and it does come easy. And you have things like Bad Batch. There's this program where they're trying to, like, basically find people like Grogu and, um, you know, the clone girl uh, and and um take the essence of her Omega. so they can yeah. Omega and right. recreate. Uh, there's the Snoke program. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's the emperor behind the scenes, apparently. You know, we know now he's alive and he's hell-bent on reanimation coming back uh, in a successful way, in a legitimate way where he can sustain life and power. I don't know maybe the, the durability of that if it's reanimated, but surely he would then know that they've returned. He would know the the stories, the 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 tales of Thrawn, what's happened would then be regaled to him. And then he would probably look at that as a source of potential magic or force uh, mm. to bring himself back sooner than waiting 30 years to what was slightly convoluted and, you know, rise of Skywalker. But um, maybe, I, I, yeah. So it's like, does that get reconciled in or does he not know about that? Or maybe that's got to be written off as like a, um, a lesser form of, of resurrection, I guess that too, it's not going to sustain him more than yes, uh, and maybe this is just me having this this sort of play out in my mind in a certain way, which is, you know, you may get maybe we get a second season of Ahsoka, we get a we get a season of, um, maybe Rebo. another season Max of. Rebo. <laughs> no, no, maybe we get a a, a season of uh, no the Jude Law series. Uh, Skeleton crew, skeleton crew, and maybe even a fourth season of Mandalorian before we get the Filoni film. But I do think that yes. they're all going to lead to this, this huge moment. Maybe the acolyte is out there and it's going to drop some breadcrumbs about uh, the, the grand or the great mothers. And it, it could explore some Ooh. of that witch territory yes. in acolyte. But what it seems like it's leading to is a, is another uh, intergalactic conflict of, the remnant empire versus the 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 new republic you got to have the big 3 i don't think you can have a galaxy wide conflict without incorporating the big 3 who knows how they'll pull that off but they have to and then you're going to say then you look at the sequel trilogy which was you know meant to be this big epic conclusion to the saga and it's like wow how do you not run the risk of sort of like 
you know, uh, making it so anticlimactic by the time you get to episode seven, eight, and nine, or is it like, hey, that ship has sailed. We don't care. They right. don't have to be deferential. It's a mix. To, no. to it's going to be a mix. Story. Exactly. It won't be deferential, but I, uh, but I do think you will not see in a Dave or somebody else movie. I mean, I'm ninety percent certain they're not going to then go make those films about those three characters. They might be in a big meeting and they're like, all right, you, you, our heroes are going off to do this and Han is going off to this and you see the Falcon take yeah. off. And yeah. I don't think they're going to be front and center as like cross cutting Hans yeah. and doing this yeah. over here. And now we're going to cross cut to Hera. I, I, I think well, that's I think of the money shot, a challenge, like, which is Luke fighting the dark troopers. We have to get some. It's Vader coming down the corridor in Rogue One. Those are the <laughs> character money shots, and that's what makes it all pay off. Sure, they don't have to dominate the story, right. but yes, have them in the war room, send them off in the Falcon, and then show them near the end in some like give them each one or two minutes on. They can come in and save the day at some point or something, or help as save they the danced day. around. They danced around, you know, Princess Leia in the series. They sure did. Mm-hmm. Yes. And they, George Lucas um, said in the Star Wars Underworld series that you would be aware of the presence of the main characters from the original trilogy and the prequels, but they would be in the background and they would be as talked should, about, yeah. so, but they wouldn't they wouldn't steal the spotlight. And like you said, it's about the character. As, as long as we are invested in that lead character, yes, um, and we believe the world around them has the authenticity, um, the grounding that it also coexists with the imagined reality of Lou, Khan, and Leia still existing. Um, yeah, sometimes I think Marvel Comics and stuff goes like too height and too far. Like, all this happened? Like, oh my God. But I think if you touch on it just enough mm-hmm. and you give it that, that, like, that grounding, that, you know, underpinning, mm-hmm. that they're mentioned they're talked about just like Leia was just like in accents like just like Leia was in Rogue One you can't overdo it but I then it, you let those stories be about the characters that are front and center that's why something like Andor works so well that's why this yeah. you know series can work so well because you, you you love Ahsoka you realize she's worthy yes the Luke Skywalker story that is the greatest story the greatest hero's journey ever told that is the saga there's a reason we focused on that that's primal and central but it doesn't mean that all the other Jedi's never existed. Like you don't have to hear about what a, what Ahsoka was doing to have that trilogy work, and yeah, it's not doesn't yeah. devalue because she exists. So they'll tell a story that exists and is worthy on its own at a scale on its own, and it'll be a galactic war, just like Air of the Empire and Last Command mm-hmm. and um, Dark Force Rising were like huge thing, and it didn't. You know, I th- I think those still. If you said those existed and the sequel trilogy, I wouldn't say that I don't buy it, you know? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and the fully realized, realized trilogy with a massive war. And there's been other books that have detailed all that stuff. So I don't think they they can't be afraid. They just have to mm-hmm. go tell good stories. There yeah. you go. And what you said about Luke Skywalker's hero's journey being the greatest example of that type of storytelling – I don't think that's hyperbole because Joseph Campbell himself referred to George Lucas as his greatest pupil. So you can look it up. It's in the Bill Moyer interview. I literally, there is no cinematic trilogy that exemplifies a greater hero's journey. There's not. I call in, yell at me. I don't care. There's nothing. There's <laughs> I, nothing. Well, the man who I, devised the formula any... of the hero's journey agrees with you a There's thousand nothing. It's the best. It's the, don't even stop. Yeah. And you know what? It's great. You know why it's great? Because Luke is special. I'm tired of people saying, oh, the Force isn't special. Anyone? No, Luke is special. Luke is, there is something innate about him because of who, what's in his blood. And also because of him being uniquely positioned to be the sole person that could unlock his father on the human level. That's so right. That's, why that's, the that's key it. To the it's character. a human story. It's not even the force. It's him yes. on a on a human level. It's father and, son. That's what's and so that's powerful. what the original trilogy is all about. That's exactly that's what the original force. trilogy is about. What's that? Force can't just be in everybody. I, I I mean yes. I wanted to ask you what you think about the force suddenly becoming 
a tool in Sabine's toolbox. Now, we watched her do exceptional things throughout Star Wars Rebels, but outside of some Darksaber training she did with Kanan, we really didn't see any true Force abilities in her. And now the story is picking up where not only is Sabine shown potential to become trained as a Jedi, she gets referred to as a Padawan, but she's already been deemed untrainable at this point. Now, of course, we get the big reveal about that in the very final episode, but I just am wondering what, what you think about that and what kind of statement that makes about normal citizens touching the Force. It's... It's a can of worms. I love the aspirational qualities. I understand as a brand, you want to imbue hope in everyone and say, everyone can be a Jedi. But if everyone's a Jedi, then no one's a Jedi, right? So you have to be, it has to be something that it's a gift. You're touched. It's it's congruent in mythology. So let's not, let's not undo religion and mythology and history just to make a bunch of people feel okay. Okay? There's people that are special at it and... We're not. We're talking about it because there are Jedis in this world we want to believe in, right? Luke is one of those gifted people. Luke could do things that he didn't realize what he was doing. He could do things with Beggar's Canyon and flying a ship, and Anakin could do things, and he didn't even know why. He could, a human at eight years old can pilot a pod racer? That's insane, you know? Um, they're gifted in a certain way, not just Skywalkers, but Force users. That's why the, the, the Jedi went around the galaxy and collected them. They procured them from families at very early ages, probably too early, you know, in order to not them be, let them be mutated by the cultures around them, but to keep them in a pure setting so they could harness what it is to be beacons of light and good. Um, if everyone can be this, it, it kind of, it, it takes, I mean, it just dims the light. It dims the light. And I think you think you're making it better, but you're making it worse. Not saying that Sabine's making it worse because I've been very outspoken. I, I thought Sabine was the, the poochie of the Star Wars universe. <laughs> I remember I, and I, that. Yes. I, look, I, Rebels is my favorite Star Wars show. I love Rebels. Really? She More than Clone be, Wars? Yeah. I, it's, you know why? Because it's like really? it's a Star Wars role-playing game. You watch these characters go level up consistently. We're not jumping around. Mieber, Gascon, all this crap. It's yes. not in it. Like, tell a story. Tell the characters. Let them evolve. I love Clone Wars. World building, expansion, great. Rebels was a family. I watched them grow. Um, so I really liked that aspect of Rebels, and I felt the growth. I felt the world open up. I felt these characters mature. And I always felt let down by the fact that Sabine was a character that was good at everything. Um, she was the Banksy fet of Star Wars Universe. She could graffiti. She was a demolitions expert. She was... You know, an ex imperial, and she's only 17. You know, it was, it was a little, <laughs> she's much. lived a life. So, she's lived a life that girl. Yeah. And she could also do flips and jumps that only Kanan and Ezra could do. And people are like, well, that's because she, she was good with the force. It's like, no, she's not been good with the force. They've said she's the worst at the force in their whole history of the force. So, Aang's like, you're the worst. <laughs> so, let's not say it was, she was exemplifying it in Rebels. That was just bad choices oh, in Rebels. Okay. okay. She doesn't have the gift. Um, and I know one of my gripes is throughout this show, she's working on it combat. She's working on lightsaber combat, mm -hmm. this training. She's not working on meditative connection. Right. She's right. She's not working on inward introspection. She's working on outward. She's trying to move a cup. Station. Right. Emotionally, I get that the whole show was about her. She's going to do anything she can to get Ezra home. That's what she's sworn to do. So that resonated with me. I just don't know if I totally buy that she was at the the skill level to do that. But you know what? I went with it because it was a big moment. And at that point, I emotionally believed it. But for Ahsoka to have spent so much time training someone with no innate abilities makes me like, what the hell were these two doing while the Galactic Civil War was going on? Why are you wasting your time with someone with no abilities when you could have been helping? It the just, only thing it, I can it, think of, the team up only with Luke. thing I can think of in my own headcanon until we know otherwise is that perhaps Sabine was so devastated at the loss of her family, maybe she was blaming herself that Ahsoka would, was willing to do anything to help her. And no, so she started she was, counseling her. But pri prior oh, to that, no. what was she doing? She, she was already being trained. We don't know that. 
Yes, we do. From Hu Yang's dialogue, he says he was training. She was training uh, Sabine, and then the Empire devastated the planet. And at that time, Ahsoka decided that Sabine. Could I've not read. I've reread that dialogue multiple times it's after we had that conversation. Yes. I don't think it's definitive. At I all. think it's totally definitive. He says at that it's, time. At that. The bottom time, line, though, Jimmy is how it was handled was not good enough. That's well, I know. I but it just wasn't good enough right here. It just we picked apart it, the it, storytelling it, failures along the way, but now it's le- yeah. it's up to us as fans to fill in the blanks and try to speculate on what the hell is going on here. Well, and then I'm out of ideas of why she would pick this person who has absolutely zero force ability. <laughs> that has not and- ever been revealed. We have no foundation for what actually revealed Sabine to show potential as being trained as a Jedi. I'm pulling Don't up my notes. Don't you think that should have been brought up here at some point? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Think that is an, that's foundational to the trajectory of this narrative and to the, the, the inner conflict, the outward conflict of the story. That is so foundational. It has, it's intrinsic. It's got to be in the first five minutes. Here are my notes, and I, I quoted this from the show. Why Ahsoka left Sabine? Timeline established is what it says here. Ahsoka became concerned Sabine was training for the wrong reasons after Mandalore. At the end of the war, we still don't know which war exactly, but I'm thinking it's the Galactic Civil War. So this would yep. have happened around the time of Endor and Return of the Jedi. At the end of the war, the Empire purged the entire surface of the planet. At the time, Ahsoka felt that if Sabine unlocked her potential, she would become dangerous. Revenge. Yeah. Revenge, of course. What's interesting is if you establish that in episode one and you explore it for eight episodes, and then you show how she's proven she's not dangerous to herself. Yeah, I'm with you. I don't understand what the benefit was. It's a dramatic paradigm. You created a paradigm which gives you meat to explore as opposed to saying, I, every episode going, I, I don't know. I mean, I like it, but what? what? I, I don't know. Like, I don't, And I shouldn't feel like that. I want to feel like on the edge of my seat, like, are we going there? Are we getting this? We're not. Next time. Oh, she fails. She falls on her face. Like, that's what the tension in the writing, the conflict, knowing, t- tantalizing, like dangling success in front of your character and not letting them get it or putting – things in their way that you know are speed bumps and seeing how they deal with them. But you have to know what the problem is before the speed bump means anything. It's foundation. Let me ask ask you another question, specifically lore based. Um, When Jason Solo is hearing the lightsabers, he insists, Oh, Jason I'm, Sindula. I come so well. We were talking about yeah. Air of the Empire and stuff. And yeah, I think oh, I think yeah. they named the character Jason as a tribute to Jason Solo from the old expanded universe. Or I think yeah. it maybe maybe might be a tribute to our own Jason Swank. You never know. But uh, either way, there's a Jason in Star Wars. So Jason's everywhere, including our uh, main man, Mister Swank. Rejoice! So he insists that Hera stand there. His mom, listen, don't you hear it? And she closes her eyes. This has been a subject of debate online. Do, do you think she actually heard the lightsabers or she was more reacting to having confidence in him and his abilities? Her confidence in him because there's no reason or no way she could hear. Yeah, but Dave is giving out <laughs> force powers to everybody. <laughs> no, no, no. We cannot, we, if that starts to happen, we, we then as fans have to rise up and say, we won't, no, we won't take it. It totally makes the, it makes the original trilogy garbage if we start doing that. You know what I mean? It's like then Han, Han's force sensitive and he's flown from one oh, side of the Han galaxy is to the force other. sensitive how, because he shows up as a force ghost to, uh, that to Kylo Ren. Sensitive. That That's the force manifesting something for, right. uh, for Ben. But some and people say I, from I, The Force yeah. Awakens when he points the blaster and shoots that stormtrooper without even looking. Some people say, hey, that's Force. Some people like Mission to Mount Yoda. So let's not. Let's Mission not to Mount there. Yoda. I love that book. <laughs> we have to do a roundtable about Mission to Mount Yoda. <laughs> and the glove of Darth Vader. A few of the Bendham's action figures. And Mount um, Yoda. And, and Trioculus. Trioculus. Oh, yeah. Trioculus. And Ken. The Jedi oh, yeah. Prince. Ken, 
the Jedi Prince with Malibu so, Barbie. Hey, Kyle, before uh, we want to yeah. we want to talk about the book, but I want to do so. I want to do a a quick speed round here with you, if we could. Which oh, is wait. oh, look at this. Oh, we got our own God. Jedi. Wow, Jedi. nice cameo here. Wow, look Junior at him. he's Jedi. such a big boy now. You are the sweetest little guy. Last time I saw you, <laughs> you were small. You were smaller than a football. Look at him. Wow. Holy crap. Mm. Kyle, you really are a dad. I can't believe it. Yeah. This is this is no, but you know that maybe when you said, what do you think? Did she believe? Did she hear it too, or did she believe? And, and if you have kids, you know, you believe. You believe in yeah. what they they wonder, what they see, what they hear. You want to be open to the the imagination and and that's why they say kids have the ability to you know commune with with dead and things like that it's because there is there's an innocence to them and they don't yeah. block out we block much out with fear and with um protocol of life that we we aren't open to some of the mysticism and the magic out there um and i think she's just looking at her son with wonder saying wow like i see canaan in you she's not saying yeah i hear lightsabers really and if it is, I mean that's fine, but it's kind of crap. If that's, <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> no, I yeah, it's no, I'm here. Now hear magic stuff too. It's just like, come on, just make it. Stop, I think you know? I think Hera is the mother of the the son of a Jedi. Has witnessed countless numbers of times in his young life where he has done amazing things. Bingo! It wasn't and her first time. It was not her first time at the rodeo witnessing his force abilities. And I think, you know, he says, mom, mom, listen. And like any parent supporting their child, they stand there and, and, and try to see things through their eyes. Yeah. And, and so, and And she's desperate to find her friend too. So this is their best lead and she's going to go. with it. She's going to believe she has faith in her son and i i gotta tell you i have faith in the force because your little guy as we're ha- initiating this conversation about a parent connecting with their child there he is again that's <laughs> little Etienne. there he is right that that's the letty yes that's, that's etienne yeah that's etienne. him yes look and overall I, you know what it is the series it pulled me in i i fell in love with it and i liked it don't you think the magic of star wars exists in it kyle the magic is there Oh, the magic is there. There's some really wonderful scenes, especially in that final episode. There was there was stuff I, I I craved for more of. I just wanted more information. I wanted more clarity. That doesn't mean I didn't like it. It just means, you know, maybe don't make the episode 34 minutes. Maybe make it 38 and put the stuff in it needs. You know, we need stuff. They gave us regular Oreos, and we need double stuff. I need double stuff. You know, the MacGuffin to open the season a little bit much, a little maybe misguided. You know, what happened in three episodes could have been. One and a half. I think um, the failure in handing over the star map, they handled that interesting. It was frustrating at the time. Never, But it was never really addressed. I don't know if they ever fully addressed it between... They danced around what she did. They didn't really address it. They did it in a um, non-direct way. But it still, they still addressed it okay. I think that... you know, I know they were probably going for the circularity. It ends with, it ends with two of the worst scenes in the series. It starts with the worst scene and it ends with the worst scene. When it opens with that guy, the New Republic guy. I know. Listen, like a bonehead. I, I heard you rant about this. this guy before. Oh, my God. <laughs> what? What? They just, Grant Moffat <laughs> just kidnapped off a ship. They've had a, a Mandalorian season one. They had guys break into a high-speed ship cruising through space and break out prisoners. This guy's, like, going to invite an Imperial ship on. I'm going to teach them a lesson. You're like, <laughs> oh, my God. What is going? The logic went out the window. And the light I've heard you ran out the window when a, yes. when Ezra flies in, doesn't say, "Hey, it's Ezra." He's like, "Maybe I want to see if they shoot me or not." And he gets <laughs> off the ship. And he's got a helmet on, and he's like, keeps walking at them. And they're all like, and he still keeps walking. You're like, I get it; it's for dramatic effect. But like, maybe he stole a ship and it crashes, and then they get him out, and he stumbles out, and then he takes his helmet off. Like he didn't have time. His comms not working. Anything, but yeah. it didn't make sense. Those are the two worst scenes outside of the the hot shin and it's like, hey, I'm not working with you anymore. That was the that was the maybe the most letdown for me. I was wow. like, you crushed me. I love these characters, and they <laughs> went from awesome to 
not sure what. Well, I've heard you complain about this new Republic officer, this whoever this sad sack is, who lets Balin on board his ship and just slice them all down. I've, I've heard, so would you say this is the he's the Ben Quadraneros of the Ahsoka series, in your opinion? <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty low. And the Giono guy with we, who there's no motivation. He's just a guy who's spewing out conflict with with zero understand audience understanding of why. What's the context? I watch yeah. resistance. I'll be honest. I, I try not to think a lot about resistance. I, <laughs> it's a low kitty show. It's a kitty show. It's, a show. it's, it's a not point. meant to be taken and, seriously. And I wouldn't say it's a kitty show. I, there's stuff I like, but I, but I, it doesn't, it doesn't resonate. And that character, I, I, I don't know what, why, what are the machinations of Shono? I want to, what is at stake? What is he getting? How does the average person mm. know anything other than, dialogue to be speed bumps for no reason and yeah it's an easy fix you know it's such an easy fix it's like so it i sure hope is. as we move forward to fix it i mean this show this is a great show it's not like down there with you know boba and obi-wan it's not there's merit in all this stuff i like it all i watch it all i watch it multiple times but i can still sit here and be honest and say it could be better you know and these there's a lot of well-directed episodes this season this last one was really well done dave's Episode five was masterfully done. That was beautiful. It reminded me of like Kurosawa's dreams. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that, but there's a couple of sequences in that movie, both the frost sequence at the beginning with the ghost yeah. and mystical tunnel with dead soldiers. And he plays a lot with smoke. And there's an amazing sequence in what dreams. Is uh, it's the mid eighties and dreams was also yeah, okay. produced by Lucas. George Lucas. Yeah, okay, um, that's the one George collaborated. As a matter of fact, George had to fund that film because it wouldn't have been completed because they ran out of money. And George saved the day on film. that. And was able to collaborate then with his, his hero, uh, Kurosawa. It's, Dreams, it's, There's right? some beautiful stuff. But there is a sequence where there's this, there's this burned out planet and there's demons. And there's all this smoke and it's shrouded in smoke and it's volcanic and and you're watching this demon go from like basically like a level one to a level two demon, and <laughs> and it's the the way they play with smoke and stuff. It reminded me of like what what Dave was doing with um, all of the smoke and the shrouded transitions between you. Know, it was in a way it was like she was visited by these three ghosts of Anakin, you know, in a Christmas Carol type way, which I think is one of the greatest you know Western civilization stories ever ever told and i think there's an element of that to uh that episode that was that's that's one of the high points of star wars canon period um episode five of this is, is beautiful i just wanted to know what ahsoka's hang-up was so i could feel more out of it but it's so well done um and the end of the show is it ends really superbly despite any you know shortcomings and in, in setup that could have yielded a greater emotional payoff for me you know that's what it is i know i could have felt more after eight episodes and I know it's there it's all the it's in the DNA and he's on the right track and he's doing the right mm -hmm. stuff and he's actually going down the right taking us to a new galaxy and picking us bringing in night sisters and mortis and and the world between worlds and doing bold things that's what Dave's there mm -hmm. for Dave's the man so uh, more Dave Filoni Star Wars absolutely Dave has all the right ingredients and he yes. put, he knows how to put them in the blender, but the problem is I don't think Dave knows exactly which setting to press once he's got all the ingredients in the blender. And I think we're I think he's on the way. I think he's on the way. And if there's any storyteller, I'll be more than patient but with. Here's the it's thing, Mr. I, Dave Filoni. Dave doesn't need to be scripting all this stuff. I I, I frankly I don't know why he is. Uh, he didn't write. He wrote some episodes of Clone Wars. But he was he was the showrunner. He was you know he worked with Lucas hand in hand, putting that together. He put Rebels together. He wasn't sitting there penning every episode. Just because this is Ahsoka, I don't think that Dave needs to write and lift his leg on every episode. As a human and a friend, I'm proud of Dave that he's like, I'm going to write this whole thing. I'm going to direct this this uh, these episodes. I'm going to showrun this thing. And if someone's giving you the opportunity to do it, you're not going to say no. So he took a lot on his shoulders. Maybe it's mm -hmm. next time. Yeah, maybe there's a small writer's room that that you know that contributes and challenges. Kyle Newman, give him a seat in the writer's room, and yeah. also me and Swanker on Zoom every meeting, <laughs> and that's how it's gonna go. As a fan, I I'm always 
I am proud of Dave. Like, look what he's done. He, he started with that Clone Wars movie, and he's taken that initial opportunity. And where we are in 2023, where Dave has taken Star Wars and he, how he's done it with reverence and love for George and George's creations. He isn't saying, I'm going to make it better. I'm going to subvert it. I'm going to undermine it. Dave no, doesn't thank God. Bex. No. He right. is, he is, he is an institution. He is, he's brilliant. He approaches it so with reverence. He approaches on, it. Yes. yes. He, 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 he knows Give Dave 10 more series, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I just don't think that he necessarily has to be chief clerk and bottle washer on, on, on every series. Let him put the big ideas together. Um, speaking of big ideas, Kyle, I think it's only appropriate since you and FJ are never in the same uh, on the same uh, show uh, uh, together, that we we look at his scorecard. Now we warned him that we were going to do this because you know FJ came on a couple weeks ago and we played profit or loser, and uh, so I've got his four big predictions here. Uh, that <laughs> See, I'm neither. I'm neither profit. I'm just a simple man trying to wake right. Right, to- right. But we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna rate him here, and I I know I know DeSanto is going to be listening this weekend. I he, he knew this was going to okay. happen. F.J. DeSanto, Profit or Loser. <laughs> All right, there's only four. So the prognostications from uh, F.J. Now, this th- this first one, okay, given the pacing of the series, he probably did go out on a limb here. F.J. says, big cliffhanger at the end. Thrawn returns to the galaxy far, far away as we know it. Yes. Profit. 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 Uh, but that profit, but dude. <laughs> it's so profit. Well, the heroes run at the like of course that was gonna happen. Did you not? Okay, we'll give it to him. I think that <laughs> the way this series went at times, I think that that hyperdrive of the eye of Scion could have been sputtering at the end of that episode and they wouldn't have gotten out of there. I don't oh, know. But come on, we know what's gonna do. That's like a PJ Masks episode. You know where it's going. <laughs> He's going to get Kyle's back. watching a lot so of kids shows these days. The galaxy. Even the Falcon was able to make the jump to light speed at the end of Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Even All right. Falcon. Okay. Number two, the Ahsoka Sabine rift will be revealed. Yes. The source of her walking away essentially yeah. was revealed mm-hmm. by her saying she thought sure, yeah, Sabine was. was too hot to handle is, is what it came down to. Too hot to handle. Ahsoka yeah. out. Yeah, I give him profit on this one. Yeah. yeah, because at the time profit. FJ came on, uh, we were we were pretty frustrated that that hadn't been revealed at that point, and FJ was like, "No, by the end of this this season, that why they why they fell apart will be revealed." Uh, number three, profit. Balin tries to take out everyone. <clears throat> Balin tries to take out everyone. No, Balin didn't do anything at the end yeah, of this he- season. By he the end, a he had three scenes. He really had three scenes of note in the final three episodes. He had one where he was like, "The enemy of our enemy is our friend." Yeah. And the next time he said, turned to this girl and he's like, "See ya." He he should have not fought Ahsoka. He should have said, I, "I don't know why he felt he needed to say I can't let you get involved." That didn't even gel with what he just told her. He mm. should have been like, "I've got no horse in the game. I am not your yes. enemy." And stepped aside. You know what I mean? That wasn't that didn't even gel with the character that they were trying to, to turn him into. So he had that scene, and then he had the scene where he's standing on top of a mountain. That's all. And I was expecting so much more from those final three episodes from Balin. I was like, what is going on on this planet? What is he hearing? What is his quest? What is his call? Yes. What is his journey? Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, they didn't that, – that was a real – missed opportunity i think while racing yeah i thought that there you know he could have at least at one point earlier on in the in the season said something like you know to shin there may come a day when our paths diverge and i need you to be strong or i need you to do whatever but it would just it just came out of the blue in my in my book um or before they jump to this galaxy jason he says to her he's like look if we go here this is why I'm going here. It's not mm-hmm. a mystery box. Tell me why I'm going there. And he's got, I need to know that you're, we're going to another galaxy to do this. You know, and she's mm-hmm. like, I'm with mm-hmm. you there. She doesn't exemplify those qualities to be a suitable, you know, subordinate to him. And then he cuts loose, but he's given her the parameters of the deal and, and the nature of what they're going to do, at least in a macro sense. I didn't know. He just, Sound like he had. I know there's something there for us, and there was no 
there are no terms. You know what I mean? That then right. she could then not fulfill. Right. So it's the setup and all these things is where it's lacking, not where the, how they necessarily resolved it. Yeah. All right. Number four. Zeb will be back. We will see Zeb reunited with his ghost crewmates. Loser. Loser. <laughs> they could have just put Zeb at the end when he gets off the ship, right? Ezra and Zeb's there with him. He's like, oh, oh, yeah. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. So, it's Kyle, okay. tell us about your book. Oh, all right. So I've got a, a awesome book. I've been working on this for the past three years. Yes. Jason's holding up. There's this regular edition. This is Lore and Legends. And the there's a Barnes and Noble. Dungeons and Dragons, Lore and Legends. We wrote a book in 2018 called Art and Arcana. Sam Whitwer, you know, um, Darth Maul and Starkiller himself is one of the. And the sun. Along with his. Yeah, and the son, along with his uh, brother Michael and our friend John Peterson, and Art Narcana was on the history of Dungeons and Dragons, visual, visually told, but there's still tons of words in it. It's about the evolution of the the art that is role playing, like um, it became a new American art form. And um, Lauren Legends picks up at, at the tail end of fourth edition of Dungeons and Dragons, you know, in 2010 ish, and it's about how they realized things weren't working. And how they came out with the best edition of the game ever. It's now it is it is traditionally analog game now and probably has fifty million plus players. And this thing was on its deathbed, you know, in twenty twelve. How did this happen? And was confluence of things that you know it all conspired to turn you know streaming, Stranger Things, um, the proliferation of fantasy in our culture you know lord of the rings harry potter game of thrones everyone's like oh i like this stuff it's not taboo i'm already a fan so it became accepted in a way where we understood it to need to be demystified we're like oh i can play a fantasy thing and and um didn't all the card all games things. also help i i, I feel like like well, people like, that yeah, thought they magic were too cool right people that thought they were too cool for and- for role-playing games they're sitting there mocking D D while they're dealing out these cards playing out you know magic and it's like oh okay i guess i get these guys yeah the taboo is spelled and so this book right. explores the past um really the past you know 11 years of of uh D history it's a true sequel to art and arcana and we were very proud of that one. That one, we got a Hugo nomination, a Locus Award nomination. I mean, it did really well. Fans loved it. And this, we wanted to you know, continue to tell the story as best we could up until next year, which is the the, tw- the 50th anniversary of Dungeons and & Dragons. And uh, there's going to be a new iteration of the game coming next year. So this really takes us through this, this point in history. So I have that that just came out. And there's a special edition coming November 28th, which is gorgeous. And then, you know, we also have a, a follow-up to our New York Times bestselling cookbook, Heroes Feast, which is a Dungeons & Dragons-themed cookbook coming November 6th. Um, that's called Flavors of the Multiverse. Pumped about that. And there's also a television show called Heroes Feast based on our cookbook coming uh, November as well. So wow. there's Who's 20 one-hour episodes. It's, it's part of Hasbro's slate of program. It includes um, uh, Faster Purple Worm, Kill Kill which is a Matt uh, Lillard-based show where he brings celebrity guests on and they, they play you know, one-hour episodes and there's another streaming show that's part of it. And so they package them together into like you know 100 hours of content. I think it's going to be on one of the free free streaming services coming wow. in November. So let's give away one of these. Oh, we have one to give away? Lord yeah, Legend. I'm going to give away. Yes, and I'll sign it. And I'm not giving away it. mine. No. There are diehard Star Wars fans. And there are diehard D and D RPG players out there. I'm sure they're all over your forums. So how can we find out who's the most worthy? Oh uh, yeah, how are we going to copy Nick. this book? There can hmm. be only one, only one. Or, or is there a more traditional method of giveaway that you want to do? I think the best way to do it is to give it away to a member of our Patreon audience, someone specifically in the RFR RPG tier. And higher. Perfect. Let's do that. They'll be eligible. And I will put up a post. It'll be a photo of the front cover of the book. And only people in that RPG tier and higher will have access to the post. 
Anyone who comments on the post will be entered to win and will choose the winner at random next week. And then that sure. winner will have to wait uh, 16 to 24 months for the uh, book to show up. That's I just say that oh, to cover our own. Book, but <laughs> okay. You'll perfect. probably get it before that. <laughs> probably well, let's, let's do it. So, okay. okay. So let's do that. Let's give it away to RFR RPG members to uh, choose your membership. Visit patreon.com slash rebel force radio and uh, become a member of the RFR Babu freak plus RPG tier. It's a double tier, double the pleasure, double your fun with the freaks and the RPG freaks. And, um, you will be eligible to win. I will put the post there. It will be there by the time this show goes live on Patreon. And uh, because Patreon gets the show before anyone else, early bird access and ad free programming. I mean, my God, just becoming a member of RFR on Patreon is totally worth it. And then you get access to cool giveaways like this one. Thanks to our friend Kyle Newman, along with his buddies, John Peterson, Michael, and Sam Whitwer. And uh, who's selling the book? Did everyone sign the book, Kyle? They haven't yet, but I'm going to get them to sign it. <laughs> it's Definitely a, I, I saw I you. Think, I think if the... you signed it, yeah, you okay. and Etienne, you, you guys will yeah. sign it. Etienne, say, may the force be with you. I've been oh, through this with both of mine. I they, they never do on. it on cue. They never yeah, do they it don't, on you, I mean, and th- this is a showbiz kid, though. you got to step it up. Oh, that's somewhere. true. All right. <laughs> oh, I heard it. Etty. Yeah, I heard it. Yeah, I heard it. He's, I heard it. Whispering. He's whispering. He's whispering. He is. It's, it's like the Jedi spirits surrounding us. Oh, Jedi spirits, yeah. Kyle, what can you tell us about A Disturbance in the Force, this documentary that we've been covering for a while now? This incredible documentary that details the uh, it's, it's the done. holiday special. It's great. Uh, since we've screened it at festivals, we've added Steve Sansweet, Gus Lopez, Patton Oswalt, and the movie's been you know enriched with a lot more footage. Um, it's going to be coming out this winter, so expect it first. Um, VOD, uh, you can purchase it, you can rent it, and streaming some streaming sometime next year. So it's coming soon. We'll have so we'll have winter more details very winter. Soon. So I mean, is it possible that we would have a better idea by life day when we might see this? We will know very soon. I'm I'm sure by the end of this month we'll be putting out some concrete cool. details. I'm very excited about it. It's still sitting there a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Can you believe it? Twenty six reviews, everyone is hundred percent. That's awesome. Yes. It, it doesn't have a mean bone in its body. It's really fun. If you love star Wars, you're going to love it. You're going to have so much fun. Everyone in it loves star Wars. You're going to leave with a real great sense of late seventies television variety. Why this thing happened. We're really going to get to yeah. of how and why it happened and see who contributed what to its, to its legacy. Cause there's a lot of, there's a lot of myth and urban legend surrounding it too. So it's nice to actually yeah, we try to get the facts. Roll the sleeves and sit down with everybody that was involved, you know, the costumers, the directors, the writers, the producers, the Lucasfilm liaisons, the dancers, everybody's in this plus, you know, historical analysis and guys like Steve, you know, had yeah. damn relations he talks about, you know, how how the perception of it evolved over the years. So it's it's pretty comprehensive, and it gives you a good yes. look at late seventies variety TV and how and probably strange it was that it dominated the airwaves. And how strange yeah. now, after all these years, that they're going to put out the first like officially licensed action figure in the it's vintage glorious. collection on a Chewy. vintage style Life car. Chewy. Well, you know what? No, there, there was the Boba Fett animated action figure, which came out in 2008. That would probably be, but this is technically the first, this is, but this, this is, is the part that George action, hated. <laughs> like George liked the, the, the cartoon. Yeah. Uh, he thought that would swell. Right. But, uh, <laughs> he sure the heck didn't like all that other crazy sitcom <laughs> crap and variety show garbage. They were infusing into star Wars. <laughs> And who can blame the man? But, you know, right. Things just slipped out of his control. I think that was a learning lesson for George, a, a learning moment for him, where he said, "Never again, never again." I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold on to this stuff with an iron fist from now on. And he right. sure did. 
That's why he so, approved everything from thereafter. <laughs> yes, a disturbance in the force. So, of course, uh, RFR has been involved in that mm-hmm. from a very yep. early stage. You guys stage. feature. There's I think some we're clips in it. From yes. RFR in it. Yeah, you, there's interview clips where you're talking to different people, and it even says, you know, RFR radio clip. Yes, so, yes. You guys are in it. RFR fans will remember some moments. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Steve Kosak, who is uh, the the man uh, heading this, one of the guys heading this whole thing. He uh, wrote a Steve companion and Jeremy. to yep. go along Steve with it. Yeah, those guys are kicking ass. And Steve wrote a, a companion book, which is going to come out in this November. And I got a, a sneak peek at that one. And, and that's a lot of fun, too. And, and there's stuff from the documentary. And there's stuff that didn't even make the documentary included in the book. Too hot. Yes. Too hot for TV. Too hot, <laughs> Too hot for the dog. Yeah. And, uh, well, Kyle, it's so great to hook up with you as always. You are, you know, on the Jedi council. <laughs> I heard somebody saying, what, what Patreon tier do we have to pay for to see the texts from the Jedi council of uh, you, me, Swank and FJ. And uh, that's too hot to handle. That's, <laughs> you want to talk too hot to handle. There isn't Yikes. enough money for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, because we need to get the most expensive lawyers, most likely. <laughs> no, I kid. I kid. I kid. No, it's not that bad. It's all it's you know, it, it's really a deep analysis. Oh, it's really wonderful, actually. So. Bring up really great points, and we're always like, yeah. I'm always learning something. Every day from everybody on the chat, I'm like, I never thought it's of that. what I, I craved uh, for uh, decades is just having yeah. buddies at my fingertips that I can just, you know, spout off on something on yes. Star Wars and then om- get almost instant feedback. Action <laughs> we always are, are dumping also, our, Rem- uh, we're bleeding our Star Wars blood into those uh, comments a lot Rem- of times. Remco of Universal fun. Monsters. We're talking yeah. about everything. Yeah, it is splintered <laughs> off like every once in a while. DC uh, Super uh, Friends. Yeah, yeah. FJ and I will go off on superpowers, or Kyle and I will go off on Remco Monsters. <laughs> I have to hit the mute on the thing. <laughs> after the, we were get going hard on with Picard DC for a while. Powers. Yes, it, right. The Game Picard Game talk was good. Uh, strange new world. Jimmy was, Jimmy was like, two. "Why are we talking track? What's going I on?" I know, I know. Here he goes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it was via those texts that a friendship with uh, Todd Stashwick blossomed. So, I mean, you know, that's right. Good things happen when the Jedi Council convenes, and uh, yes. and, and our, our listeners often get to enjoy the the fruits of uh, those conversations. So, look at you, man, Dad at home, just having a good old time talking the wars with your buddies. Life couldn't be better, right, Kyle? And James Knight turned ten today. Little James. Wow, oh, today is his birthday. Today. Yeah. Well, we better let you go because oh, we've held up All enough right. of Dad's time. Yes. But yes. Happy birthday, J.K. And uh, it's great seeing little Etienne. And uh, I, I'll, I'll get it. I'll get it. You say it, Swank. You get it. You got it. Etienne. See, Swank. Etienne. He's yeah. got that. Etienne. He's French. Etienne. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. Much, much love to you and the whole family. Thank and, you. Uh, We'll, we'll see you on the chat. And uh, if you're looking for a great follow, Kyle underscore Newman on social media, you can catch up with all of his projects and uh, highly recommend get the book for that D&D. Oh, how great. Like, you know, you got that D&D fan in your life and you're thinking, what am I going to do for Christmas? They probably have everything. You got all these new books that Kyle and uh, oh, Sam. They're and, perfect and, and, holiday books. You're right. Yeah. They're, they're, if you don't know what to get somebody, this is it. Because it they're going to get something out of both these books. They're both. I'm so proud of him. So yeah, you should be. We're proud of you, man. All right. Thank you. It's great to always catch up with you and, and hear your thoughts on the latest Star Wars, because we always know they come from a place of pure passion, but yet with a professional edge as a filmmaker yourself. So we, we always uh, thanks value for, that. Thanks for always giving me the platform to 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 vent and be passionate. <laughs> you got it. Oh, and by the way, if you're keeping score, FJ DeSanto, uh, two out of four. So you be the judge, profit or <laughs> loser, loser, <laughs> loser, profit, profit. <sighs> All right, guys, take care. We'll talk to you soon. Bye bye. Oh, is that kid the cutest? Oh, what a cutie patootie.
And Kyle always. Uh, oh, I thought you were talking about Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he's a good looking young man himself. I know we're going to get a lot of really great feedback on this one because this was really, I think, Kyle at some of his analytical best. Obviously, he's been thinking quite a bit about it, as we all have. But uh, I certainly learned a few things and, uh, you know, I've, I've entered some some new things into my my headcanon as a result of this conversation, which that's that's what it's all about. It's so much fun to do Great. it this way. We evolve as Star Wars. We do. Yeah, sure, we evolve. You know, I mean, my gosh. You know, I it, it, it always kills me when, when we get a comment every once in a while. Somebody will say, yeah, I listened to your uh, reaction on The Last Jedi. You sure did like it when you came out of the theater. It's like, yeah, we just got out of the theater. We were partying in a movie theater with... Uh, RFR listeners hanging with each other. Usually we only see each other like once a year if we're lucky. You know, the atmosphere was pretty high. Yeah. We were loving it. But as you say, Jim, we 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 evolve and we process. We've been processing the originals for 40 years. Yes. Close to 50 years. Yes. Yes. And sometimes we walk away from the things we gushed about. You know, maybe a year later feeling a little different. Sometimes we walk away from the things we were hypercritical about a year later feeling really different. So right. these things have to grow on you. They have to age. You have to see them 500 times to analyze them, pick them apart, make them part of your and lifestyle. I, and, and I just want to encourage people to have conversation with each other. You know, there's, there, there's these camps. You know, there's the... I love Disney Star Wars, and it's better than the original. There's that camp. Yes, and then there's the yes. everything Disney Star Wars sucks, and Star Wars is dead camp. And we're one fandom, guys. We, we, there's got to be something that unites us, and it's this lo the love of this universe that George Lucas created. It doesn't matter what your favorite part is. We're all in this together, so have conversations. Don't just tell me you loved it. Tell me why you loved it. Don't tell me... <laughs> why you know don't just tell me you hated it tell me why you hated it engage converse simple enough right um well if you want more rebel force radio in your life and great conversation like this one of the very best places to get that is on patreon we uh were just talking earlier about patreon and how it is going to be your source for this uh, great contest where you can register to win an autographed copy of the Dungeons & Dragons Lore and Legends book, new book from Kyle Newman. And all you got to be is a member of the RFR Babu Freak and RPG tier. That's just $5 a month right there. And you get all kinds of benefits in addition to be able to uh, enter the contest. You get the weekly full show video. You get exclusive podcasts you can't get anywhere else like the Babu Freaks and the... Uh, uh, RPG podcast, The Adventures of Podcastus, I believe it is. And Grando Podcastus. the Grand. Hey, Gr <laughs> Grando the Grand. Oh, is it Grand or Grand? Grand, right? Grand. Grand. Yes. Grand. Yeah, the like, well, like, grand. like what I used to call my maternal grandmother. Grand. grand. Yeah. She thought it was just a term of endearment. Little did she know. That it oh, was. I was thrilled when it evolved into a Star Wars term, <laughs> believe me. You know, I was like, I, yeah, you know, she she was all of that, except she didn't have the three eyes. Oh, so close. So close. But anyway, uh, so check it out. And it really is an awesome community of Star Wars fans. And if you've been listening to the live after shows, the majority of our callers, just we, we get so many calls, we got to prioritize. One way we prioritize is by putting all of the Patreon members at the head of the queue so you hear there you hear them on those after shows and if they sound like the types of uh people you'd like to hang with you can find them on rfr patreon also uh check us out on youtube youtube is a great and ever-growing place for uh, rebel force radio content as well as a lot of archival material interviews uh the podcasts get released and they get released as premieres so you can jump on there and you know you hang out with some rfr listeners and comment and every once in a while mac may show up i may show up but if you're yeah. following us on youtube you hit the subscribe and you hit the notification bell you'll know when those episodes are being released and you can jump on and chat with friends uh also on the socials we're on facebook and instagram so check us out at 
RFR Rebel Force, or excuse me, at Rebel Force Radio, excuse me, at Rebel Force Radio, the website for all things and everything. Rebel Force Radio is rebelforceradio.com. But if you want to help us out, the best thing you can do is do what you're doing right now. Keep listening, spreading the word. We just wrapped up an incredible season of Ahsoka. I know that it's certainly conversation at uh, my day job. So if you're talking to people about Ahsoka and they've got questions or they just want to know more about it, you can direct them to Rebel Force Radio and our after shows, not just after shows about Ahsoka, but all the Disney Plus series, plus the animated series, Clone Wars, uh, Rebels. We got them all. And those archives can be found at rebelforceradio.com. So please, please spread the word. Please subscribe if your podcatcher of choice allows you to do so. Love to have the subscription. Even more fun is when you leave us a review. We love those. We just have one simple rule, please. Make them good. All right. We'll see you next week for more Rebel Force Radio. We may not have after shows, but you always have RFR here each and every week. So thank you all so much. We'll see you next time. But until then, for Rebel Force Radio, I'm Jason. I'm Jimmy Mack. And remember, the Force will be with you always.